Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. All right, in our study of Proverbs, we're in chapter 6, and we've been talking, last week we talked, last two weeks we talked about verses uh, 16 through 19, actually two weeks we talked about, two weeks ago we talked about verse 13 and 16 exclusively, pretty much. But tonight we're going to continue. All we got through last week was a proud look, and that took up the whole time. So, but these are, there's six things. In fact, God adds one more, seventh, and then he ups the, uh, the temperature of his hatred, or he calls it abomination, not just hatred, which means extreme hatred. And, uh, and, and God hates what God hates so much. Remember what abomination means. The root word is omen, which is a warning that God wants to stay away from something. And when you, but, 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 but ab uh, is the prefix, in front of omen, and ab is a prefix which means to off or away. So when we move away from a warning that God says stay away from there, if God says stay away from some place, and instead of going away from it, if you're going away from the warning, you're going toward the thing you're being warned about, right? So God hates that. He really hates it when you've been warned about something and you do it anyway. So. Uh, so that's what abomination is. And by the way, that video is on uh, where we did that Bible study on the word abomination. All right, I was surprised by that. I had no clue what the root word was, and I thought, well, I'm going to check that out. Boy, was I surprised. So uh, we're going to deal with the lying tongue. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to, in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh the lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. First thing I want to point out is that you have lying. It's a list of seven things, seven things that God hates. Two of them have to do with lying. Now that, that, so before we even talk about a lying tongue, I wanted to point that out. Two out of seven, 14 point something percent, instead of 7%. No, no, let's see, it'd be 28%. That's right, two, yeah. 28, almost 29%. Anybody know the, the 14 point what? How much is a seventh? 14.67 or something like that? I, I want to say it's 14.66. Anyway, if it is, then it's, uh, then it's 29%, over 29%. But otherwise, it's 28% at least of, of what God hates it has to do with lying. A lying tongue, and then later on, a false witness that speaketh lies. And then the last one, he that soweth discord among brethren. And by the way, it's kind of hard to sow discord without brethren without lying. You know? So it might be up be more. There might be three things about lying. So God hates lying. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We won't be long tonight um, by necessity. Um, but let, let's pray first. Father, I pray that you bless us tonight. And Lord, I really need your help because you know how upset I am about what's going on with Kent Hovind. And uh, he's on my mind constantly, and you know that's our prayer. We've been praying for him for years, and now it's come to, to this where they're trying so hard to keep him behind lines. So we pray for that. But Lord, right now, I need your help to focus on, on this. And uh, I may have a hard time, but if I do, it's because I'm going to point out lies being told about him. So it'll be applicable. But anyway, I just trust you, Lord, to help me and guide me and help all of us to see how much you hate a lying tongue and help us to decide we're going to really, really work at disciplining ourselves to control our tongues so that we do not lie. So bless us, we pray, through this Bible study and anybody else who hears or watches this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A lying tongue. God hates a lying tongue. Now why? Well, here's a good clue. Anybody know what John... 14.6 says, from memory, anybody recognize the reference? John 14.6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way unto him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. He's the truth. So a lie is the opposite of truth. So a lie is the opposite of God. Satan is a lie. He's a liar. Jesus said he's the, he's the father of lies. He's the, he's the head of it all. He's the, 
He's the source of lies. He's the corrupter. He's the one who deceives. And when you deceive somebody, you tell lies or you add a little bit of lie. Isn't that what uh, Satan did to Eve in the garden? Yeah. He said, ye, he, a bold-faced lie. Ye shall not surely die. So that, that's what the devil's all about. So a lying tongue, God hates a lying tongue because it's, it's the antithesis. Or it's the opposite of him, of who he is, his character. Jesus himself in the garden of, uh, when he prayed in John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them, talking about his disciples, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's what he said to the Father. So God is truth. Jesus is the word. Jesus, uh, the word of God is truth. Now you see why God hates lying? He hates a lying tongue. A tongue that instead of tells the truth, tells something that is false. Man, I used to love true and false questions in school because they were easy. You got a 50-50 chance of getting it right, whereas multiple choice, you got a, a less of a chance of getting it right. Only 25, if it's A, a through D, you got a 25% chance. So I love the 50-50 chance, but still you got 50% chance, chance of, going, of, of, of being wrong of making a false statement. It's like when I go soul winning, I ask somebody, I'll, I'll ask people a lot of times, if you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Um, or if you could put a, if, if you're a little bit, you think you might, but let, let me put it this way. Do you think you got a 50-50 chance of going to heaven? Or do you think you got a 75-25 chance? And, or maybe even an 80-20? And I always raise my voice like that, like hopefully. And people usually, yeah, about 80-20. Or some people say 90 I, got, I had one person tell me, 99% sure. And I said, well, that means you got a 1%, or if they say 90, you got a 10%. If you say 50, you got a 50% chance of spending an eternity in hell. So when you look at the opposite side, it looks pretty bad. And I always tell them, I wouldn't want one-tenth of a percent of a chance to go to hell. And... Uh, so, uh, how have you ever been deceived before? Been tricked by somebody? Well, if you've been deceived once, you might be deceived again, right? So, do you want to take any chances like that? No, not me. So, anyway, so, so truth is so very important. Truth cannot be compromised. When you compromise truth, you have error. You have lies. Even if you compromise just a little bit, people talk, say this, well, I just told a little lie, just a little white lie. Oh, yeah, I didn't know lies had color in the first place, number one. And then number two, a little bit is bad. <laughs> As I like to use this in illustration, I love water. I'm thirsty too, so I'll take a drink. Man, that's good. Anybody want to drink? <laughs> now, you don't want to drink out of why? Because I just drank from it. Most folks wouldn't do that. But there are some that would. But I really doubt if I get anybody to drink after doing this. Now, who wants a drink that might have before? No, huh? Uh. Well, I mean, I really, I, I just made sure it's just a little bit of spray. I didn't like get up a tongue full or whatever. Just a little bit, of, just a spurt. Oh, you'd take a spoon and dip the top out? Well, I'll, I'll fix that for you. <laughs> now it's all stirred up with my finger, and you don't know where this has been, but anyway. <laughs> I did wash it before coming to church. But, um, but anyway, no, it doesn't take much, see? And so you don't, you don't want a little bit of a lie because that corrupts, see? So impurities, if something, if you add a little bit of impurity to purity, you no longer have purity. If you add a little bit of falsehood to truth, you no longer have truth, see? So, and by the way, that's why we are supposed to be people who believe the word of God, not the word of man. Because if man, any of those words belong to man, then they're not God's words, and therefore you cannot trust. Man's a sinner, so man could have some corruption in there. That's why I believe in the eternally preserved, perfect, inspired word of God. I believe that's what I have in my hand. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'd be out farming. <laughs> Making an honest living. But I believe with all of my heart, every word in this book is the word of, well, no. 
every word of the text. <laughs> this, this happens to have some notes in it, so, which I'm in the habit of using that, and I haven't, I haven't changed over to the to Bible. I've got in my office that has no notes. Same layout, but no notes. All the columns and the place for notes are empty, and I'm looking forward to that, but I'm, I'm one that likes to wear up my Bibles. But anyway, uh, but the text is the Word of God. I believe that with all of my heart, so much so I live by it, and uh, I organize my life by it, and I'll stake my life on it as well. So, truth must be truth, otherwise if it's anything less then truth is added to it. It's no longer lie, and therefore it does not represent God, because God is truth. God cannot lie. Second, uh, or First Thessalonians, uh, no, Second Thessalonians 2, 1, or first, whatever. Anyway, chapter 2, verse 1, um, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So, we have to have truth, and God hates a lying tongue, because He is truth. All right, turn to Psalm 58. Let's look at a few verses real quick. Psalm 58, Psalms 58, and verse 3. The first two verses, David asks the Lord to deliver him. He says, deliver me. The first two words of both verses, first three words of each verse is deliver me from. And then verse 4, he says, for lo, here's the why, for lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord, Oh, that's chapter 9, 59. Sorry about that. But I was thinking, what a perfect verse to describe what Ken Hovind's going through, right? <laughs> yeah. Lord, you can distract me if you want, if you want me to talk. But yeah, hey, let's look at that now that I mention it. Doesn't that fit exactly what's going on with Ken Hovind? Lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, people that have power. Not for my transgression. He hadn't done anything wrong, but yet that judge said, you're worse than a rapist. He said, you're the head of a criminal, massive criminal organization. Well, I don't know about massive, but a criminal organization. Well, she said that in her sentencing. That was not proven in court. Judges speaking opinions. Judges, yeah, it's just, anyway, she makes me sick. Um, or it makes me sick to see, not she. I got to remember, it's what she's doing that's bad. She also is a victim, but she's a willing victim because she's doing this on purpose. But anyway, no, ch chapter 58, let's go there. Back to the Bible study. Okay, <laughs> verse 3. Um, I, 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 got, I, I am so upset about You know, I want, I want to preach every Sunday and every Wednesday about Kent Hovind and publicize it until something's judgment is done, right? But anyway, all right, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Keep in mind what the word wicked means. Remember that? That's where we get the word wicked. It's devil worship. Devil worship is any worship we have anybody besides God. That's what wicked, wickedness is. Anything that's related to the worship of anything we're putting up in the place of anything in the place of God. That's what wickedness in the Bible is. And so that's what the English word means in its, its, its etymology. So, the wicked are estranged from the womb. Why? They're away from God. Why? They're brought up in a false religion already. Their mother's probably reciting chants or prayers to some false god while the baby's in the womb. So they are estranged from the womb. Of course, of course they're born in sin. They're estranged from the womb and they speak lies. As, as soon as they be born, they speak lies. So, uh, that's the way the wicked are. And God doesn't want us to be like the wicked. All right, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Let's start with verse 1 for context sake. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Notice that attachment to the devil, again, or, or devils, um, which are the angels that followed the devil. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Now, when you speak lies in hypocrisy, that means you're going to try to act and put on like as if you're telling the truth, but you're not. You're being a hypocrite, okay? I don't mean you, I mean people that, that, that do this, all right? So, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So, people don't speak lies in truth. They don't speak lies in honesty. That's an oxymoron. You speak lies in hypocrisy. And people don't speak lies... By broadcast, hey, I'm going to tell you a lie now. Listen up, listen up. 
Can you imagine? <laughs> All right, here, here's a, a heathen guy on a street corner. Hey, folks, I got to tell you something. I want you to listen up. I'm going to tell you a lie. No, liars don't foretell that they're telling a lie. Now, their body language may, but they will not tell with words. Hey, I'm going to tell you a lie. I got a whopper for you. Listen up, man. It'll help you. No, no such thing happens. Why? You cannot speak lies except in hypocrisy. The little boy who says to his mama, I didn't have any cookies. My hand wasn't in the cookie jar. He's not going to say, oh, mama, I've heard about that. Yeah, that proverbial hand in the cookie jar. Yeah, mom, well, I'm going to tell you a lie, though. Well, I just want you to know it's a lie, but I didn't take any. <laughs> I wasn't in the jelly jar. No, people always tell lies and hypocrisy. They act as if they're telling the truth when they're not. So it's the only way you can speak a lie is in hypocrisy. So, um, and by the way, that's why you can carry this further. That's why all evolutionists, all atheists are hypocrites. And they, their excuse for not going to church, oh, church is full of hypocrites. No, people that don't go to church are all hypocrites. You cannot deny the truth except in hypocrisy. It's impossible. <laughs> Man, this is, this is, I like this thought. All right, so they speak lies and hypocrisy. All right, I got to go on. I, boy, I want to park there a while, but I won't get done if I do. First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. And by the way, if you want to not be a hypocrite, just make sure you, you ask God to help you to control this tongue. And otherwise, you're going to end up being hypocritical at some point in your life because you tell a lie. And we all do, so uh, on occasion, sometimes just we don't want someone to know the truth, and it doesn't, they shouldn't, know, maybe it's even a time when it's none of their business, but we still, we think we have to defend, and so we'll tell these lies, these instinctive defensive lies. And we've got to learn to hate that. Better just keep your mouth shut. Let people think what they want. But don't speak lies if you can help it. Do, work at it. All right, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have, well, let's pick up verse 5 so we know the context. This then is the message which we have heard of him, in other words, of Jesus, this is John writing, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. By the way, in him is no darkness at all. But yet the Bible says his pavilion is darkness. But in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, let me break that down a bit. Here's someone who says, I have fellowship with the Lord. But they're walking in darkness. And what does it mean to walk in darkness? If a person's walking in darkness, does that mean they're, they're not... Uh, okay, what do you think it means? Walking in darkness means that you're not, you're going against the truth. You might say you believe in him and you have faith, but in reality you don't. You're just pretending. Very good. Because, okay, can a Christian walk in darkness? Yes. Can a child of God walk in darkness? No. <laughs> <laughs> you contradicted yourself. One of them, you're right. <laughs> you're... Oh, oh, a true Christian. A, a true Christian. Yeah, when I say Christian, I'm not talking about like the world calls Christians, like those Christians getting killed over there in, in Afghanistan or wherever. But anyway, so, but, but a child of God can walk in the flesh, but he cannot walk in darkness because we're children of light. Right. See? Now, you can walk in the flesh, and, but, but we walk in light. So people that are not saved who say they have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness. They're walking in darkness because they don't know the truth. They're not in the light. They've never been born again. See, now, the flesh, we're, we're in this world, but being in the world does not mean you're in darkness. When Jesus said men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, he's not talking about saved folks who do sin, commit sins in a closet or in a darkness or at night. He's talking about people who walk in darkness. They've never been to the light. They've never trusted in Christ as their Savior, Jesus, who is the light. So, so even when, a, Christ, when a, child, a true child of God sins, they're not walking in darkness. They're just, they're walking in the flesh. 
And they're, why? Because their spirit, the spirit cannot walk in darkness. And once you've been born again, you've been born again of the Spirit of God. And that's not your body being born again, like Nicodemus thought. No. That dead spirit you inherited from your father, which you inherited from his father, all the way back to Adam, has been born and quickened by the Word of God. We're begotten by, of his own will, begat us through the Word of truth, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And, and, and the Word of God, by the way, is light too. Thy word is a lamp into my feet and light into my path. Jesus is the light. He dwells within our hearts by faith. So a child of God cannot walk in darkness. Now, we can walk in a world that's in darkness, but we're not in the darkness. A good illustration of that is in, in, in the Egyptian plagues, God sent darkness, but there is light in all the dwelling places of God's people. The world was in darkness, but they weren't. Why? They were God's people. See, so, so Paul's talking about if we, say, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. See, just like he said, if I preach some other gospel, let me be accursed. Paul is saying there's going to be some Christians who are going to seem like, sound like, talk like Christians, but they're not. Yeah. They've never put their trust in Christ as their Savior, the real Christ. They either went through the motions or they believed in a false Christ. It's very similar but different. Like Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because some people are going to say, Lord, and they're going to do it in a pompous way. Or they're going to do it to, to fulfill some, somebody's prayer. Say, hey, pray this prayer and you go to heaven. But they have no faith in the word of God. and They don't admit that they're a sinner deserving of hell. And that there's nothing they can do about it. And Jesus did all that could be done about it. And they need to put their trust in him. And they need to know who Jesus is. Um, and then when they put their faith and trust in him, then God saves them. Now, so if they just go through the motions, do you think God knows if people really believe in him or not? He knows the heart, yes. So does he save everybody that calls on the name of the Lord? No, unless they believed. See, that's why Jesus said, it seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah, whosoever. Remember I studied on ever? Ever is a limiting word by its context. What's the context of Romans chapter 10 and verse 13? The previous verses. I talk about if you believe in your heart. See? So that's the limiting thing. If ever a person believes in their heart and they call upon the Lord, they shall be saved. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, because they, don't, they say it, but they don't believe in him. And then the next verse, verse 23, I think it is. No, verse 22. He says, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus said, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. So on judgment day, there's going to be a lot of people that people thought, oh, I thought he's a good preacher. Priest, what they called the gospel. But God never knew them because he knew in their heart they were just following, going through the motions. It wasn't real. There was no real faith. No real reliance and total dependence upon God and persuasion that the word of God is true and that they were a sinner and that they deserved hell and had no way of escape except through Jesus Christ and his payment. So it's, it's very important that we make very clear the plan of salvation. Not just rush through it, but make sure they understand why they need to put their trust in Jesus Christ. Why, how he paid. And the fact he's the only one that could. It's, it's impossible for anybody else to pay for sins. Because the price is an eternal penalty and only an eternal God could pay that. And Jesus did. When he dipped his soul into hell, he paid an eternity's worth for all of us. Thereby making it possible for anyone whosoever will believe. So, um, so it's real important. 
If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Look at further down. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That means Jesus does not live in their heart. The Word of God is not lodged in their heart. They may know some up in their head, but it's not in their heart. They have, the truth is not in them. So, truth and lies do not coexist. They are like oil and water. Once you mix one with the other, the other ceases to be. See? Uh, truth is no longer truth when you mix a lie with it. Well, I can't say either, because you can't mix, you can't take a lie. Oh, I'm going to add a little bit of truth to the lie. Okay, now I got truth. No, it only works one way. See? So, um, all right, let's go to another verse. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9. Plain, plain statement here. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Well, what if we don't put off the old man with your deeds? Then we can lie, right? So, let me ask a question. Can a child of God ever lie? Yes or no? <laughs> Trick question. Huh? Okay. Let me reword the question and then see if you get it. Can the mouth of a child of God, can a child ever, of God ever use his mouth and tell a lie? That's a definite yes. Okay. But what's a child of God? Is your body a child of God? That's right. See? So a child of God cannot tell a lie. But a child of God can't put off, well, he can't put off the new man, but you can you cannot put off the old man, which we're supposed to do. We're supposed to reckon ourselves dead daily, right? So, so we're like a we're a new creature that's inside a body that's old and decrepit and corrupt. Okay, and this is why we have to be, we have to discipline ourselves. This is what the Bible means by work out your salvation. Why? Inside of me, God saved me by putting within me a spirit, bringing my spirit to life, which was quickened by his spirit. And so I am a child of God. And so what got born in me the day I put my trust in Christ as Savior, God put within me his seed, the, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, now it's in me, and it gave birth, it quickened my dead spirit, and that spirit is now made alive by God. It has God's characteristics, just doesn't have a body to reflect it. That I'll get at the resurrection. The only body I have is the one I got from my mom and dad, and it's not a child of God. It's a child of disobedience, you might say. Um, but it's, it's just the flesh. So what I'm supposed to do and what you're supposed to do is put off the old man. That doesn't mean commit suicide every day. You can only do that once. <laughs> it, it means put off. In other words, you know, you got to take, you know, your, your tastes, your desires, your wants, your uh, natural tendencies. You got to put them off. It's like, okay, like here's a, here's a, here, here's a, a young lady, a godly young lady trying to live for God. And here comes some worldly guy wanting to date her. What does she need to do? Give him a chance? No, if he's not saved, you don't even give him a chance. You put him off. See? No, don't give him a chance. See? So we need to put off, don't give your flesh a chance, but submit yourselves, present yourselves to God. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I've got this whole body, and it has tendencies, but if I present and yield myself to God, then my mind will be strengthened, and I will then use my mind to control my hands, my tongue, my eyes, my ears, to where I don't yield my members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but instead I yield myself unto God, as if I was alive from the dead. 
and I yield my members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, uh, another good, good verse to go with this, go to uh, 1 John, a good, really good verse to help explain this, is 1 John chapter 3. This is one of the most eye-opening scriptures I've ever came across. I mean, it had a huge impact in my life. I remember as a teenager being confused by this. <laughs> and then when I, I understand it, and you've heard me teach on it, so it's not going to be new, but, but it, it helps to reconfirm what I'm talking about, that truth and lies don't go together, and that a child of God, a child of God can only walk in truth. But in the flesh, if we don't put off the old man with his deeds, we're going to lie. Our mouth will be used to say things because our mind does not discipline ourselves. Our, our, this member of our body, and it will lie because it has a natural tendency to lie. First John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And it tells why. For his seed, seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Man, I struggled with this after I got saved. Why? Because I still sinned after I got saved. How many of you still sin? How many of you sin today? Okay, all right. But who sinned? Remember Paul, your old nature did. And it used your body to do it. Although you can sin in your mind, but still your brain is part of your body too. It's a body part. So, all right, what's the seed? All right, we're born of incorruptible seed. So, of his own will be gathered us through the word of truth. The word of God is the seed of God. A sore went forth to sow. And what Jesus said, the seed was the word of God. All right? So once we receive, and remember that the, the Jews on, on the day of Pentecost, they that gladly received his word were baptized because they had trusted in the word. They believed the word was true so that it, it received a reception in their heart. They realized that they were wrong. They received his word, and now they know that that means they accept now that Jesus is the Messiah. He was not a blasphemer. Therefore, they, had cha they already cha they changed their mind, and that's what Peter meant when he said, repent. They did repent. They changed their thinking. Now they receive this word that they have rejected along before. And so, because they received that word, that seed germinated. And it gave them new life. It caused them to be born again. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, Ye must be born again. Why? By nature you're born with a dead spirit, a body, and a soul. And you go forth from the womb speaking lies. And you need to believe in He who is the truth. And believe the word which is truth. And that truth comes in. If you receive it, it brings forth something that's just as pure. So... If we're born, and John chapter 1 says um, that as many, but as many as received him, Jesus Christ, who is the word, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Power is the word, what do you call a man who can't have children? Impotent, yes. Impotent, what's potent? Impotent means not potent. What's potent mean? You ever smell a real strong, a potent smell? <laughs> strong. It means power, see. So an impotent man is, has no power to produce children. Okay? Now, so, but God is all-powerful, right? Mm -hmm. And God has seed. He, put, he promised for way back in Genesis, He put seed in a woman. And the seed of woman would bruise the serpent. Why? It had power to do so. So, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become sons of God. So when we believe the seed of the word of God, our faith is what God uses to empower us, or the, the spirit of God empower the word of God, it has power then to cause us to be, have a new life, be born again. And what's born of God is born of that seed it's God's seed. It's God's word. So what's born of God is God's. It has nothing to do with our body. But it's in our body. Just like the soul is inside your body. You know, these movies get it sometimes right because the devil knows he inspires movie writers to get close to the truth, but he makes a bunch of lies. 
You ever see a movie where someone dies and it just looks like their body, but it's all airy or whatever, rises up? That's exactly what, well, not exactly what happens, but it's kind of like what happens. The rich man in hell, what he said, he, he saw, lifted up his eyes, his body's in the grave, but your soul has eyes, your soul has all the body parts your, 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 your flesh has. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, so you've got nerve endings, you're feeling somehow. He sees Abraham, uh, Lazarus, Lazarus far in Abraham's bosom, and said, send Lazarus, wait a minute, isn't Lazarus in the grave too? But he sees Lazarus, his soul, his soul body, send Lazarus, and he dipped the tip of his finger, that little airy thing, in water, and cool my tongue, for I'm tormenting this flame. See, there's a lot more than we know than what we can see. I just watched another Kent Hovind three-hour video, one of the one of the ones that someone was borrowing some of his material, and they said, talked about the spectrum of light. It's, if, we were to, if we were to measure it, put it on a scale that we can imagine, 2,500 miles long from California to New York, or uh, I forget what the thing was, but anyway, about 2,500 miles long, a reel of film. If you could stretch out that long, and that's a long ways, right? I mean, just going across Texas, and I mean, a real long reel of film, and the guy said, here's how much of the light that we see with our eyes, how much of the spectrum that covers. He stepped out one frame, <laughs> one little frame out of 25. That's all our eyes can see of the spectrum of light. And so all we see is the body, but there's two more parts to Christians. We've got a soul and we've got a spirit too. We can't see either one. So we can only see one third of us. Okay, now, so with that in mind, um, okay, so... Uh, as many as received him, John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The verse 13 says, which were born. And that says three ways were not born. Then it says, of God. So those that receive the word of God, receive Christ as their Savior, receive the word of truth, God empowers that word, and they're born again. But they're born of God, not of their mom and dad. This body that you see, that I have, all of its perfections, <laughs> imperfections, <laughs> just joking, I was born of my mom and dad. And a lot of the imperfections, many of the imperfections I have, I got from, well, all of them I got from them, but some, well, some were my own doing, but, but, uh, but I inherited imperfections from them. That's why man goeth forth from the womb speaking lies. Why? Because his father was a liar, and his father was a liar, and all the way back. So, so, so we're born of God. So now, Go back to 1 John, or you, I guess we haven't left it, just mentally we did. But 1 John 3, 9, I have a question. Who is born of God? That'll answer you the question. That solves the riddle. I used to think, oh, Lord, I know I asked you, and I know I was sincere. I know I asked you to save me. I know I've been born again, but I still sin. I don't understand this verse. And a little thought in my head says, okay, if you don't understand, just hold on. You'll understand it sometime. I was too young to understand at that point. And there's nobody to explain it. And one day, just from meditating on scriptures, I paid attention to the actual words. It doesn't say, whosoever is born doth not commit sin. Because that wouldn't be true. It says, whosoever is born of God. That part of you that was born of God doth not sin. And that's the Spirit. For his seed remaineth in him. The seed is the word of God. Jesus is the word. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Colossians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. If he dwells in your hearts, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. If you've been born again, he lives within you, the Spirit of Christ. Christ in you the hope of glory. He's the only reason I'm going to heaven because he's in me because I've been born of God. So, whosoever is born of God, that's the third Tim Coleman. <laughs> the second was a soul. Or maybe, yeah. Flesh came first and then the God breathes his not gives, gives us breath of life and then we become a living soul. Anyway, for his seed remains in it and he cannot sin. Who's the he? That, the he that's born of God cannot sin. So you see, my spirit never, that was born of God, has never sinned one time since I got saved. Since it got born, it's never sinned. 
And if you've been born again, your spirit has never sinned, and it cannot sin. It's born of God. It has God's attributes, and He's holy. It cannot sin. God cannot lie, and your spirit cannot lie, but your mouth can if you don't work out your salvation and let your spirit yield, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and, and so that your spirit rules over your soul and your body. Otherwise, your mouth is going to continue to lie. But when you do, you're, walk, you're, you're still walking in light because you have a light within you that will never go out. It's only those that never get saved, but hold the truth in unrighteousness. <laughs> they don't have the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. Say, my record in heaven is perfect. Not one single sin recorded in heaven. Not one. And I've committed millions since I got saved. But when I say I've committed, I'm talking about this flesh. My spirit hasn't. And therefore, that's what God deals with. He won't write one single sin down. But instead, he imputes to, to me and my record because I was born of God and Jesus Christ is God. That's where we're imputed. It's on our record, the righteousness of Christ, because I'm a child of Christ. I'm a child of God. I have his righteousness. We just have to work it out. We have to discipline ourselves. See? So it's kind of like um, here's a guy that goes to this is a poor illustration, maybe, but oh, I better quit. Man, wow, time flew. <laughs> I, okay, let me get one, one last verse, and I won't talk about it, but I just want to give it to you so you have a reference. James chapter 3, we'll read it, and then it'll be done. James chapter 3, Hebrews James chapter 3. I think I need to, I'll take a look, and if I think I don't need to do it, I'll go ahead and end. James 3, 14. Yeah, it's just, well, just a command, I'll end, end with this command. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. So, and there's other verse I could show you, you know, uh, lie not one to another, but I'm, I'm going to save time. So, so how do we do that? We've got to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God and yield our flesh to our spirit and to the Word of God, to Christ who dwells within. Put off the old man with his evil deeds and serve God. And, uh, and that's how you get victory over lying. See? So uh, it won't be complete because you'll, you can't get rid of the old man until the, the old flesh dies. So anyway, but, uh, but yeah, God, God hates, he hates lying, doesn't he? He hates it because it totally goes against his character and the character of his word. And both of them are within us. God's planted his word in your heart. It's written on the tables of your heart. And he dwells within your heart if you've trusted him as Savior. And he hates it when we lie. It just, it's repulsive to him. It's an abomination. So let's really discipline ourselves to not lie. Better to say nothing and let people make up or imagine whatever they want to. And then deal with that later than to say something on impulse and it be a lie. Then you've got to get right with God about that. You've got to confess it. And uh, so... Okay, uh, let's pray. Father, I pray that...